ask me to speak into this, so just, it's too loud, I talk with my hands, so it's going to be very, very difficult for me to do this. Um, the presentation today, I'm not going to have any formula, I'm going to have some results. Uh, I'm not going into the deep science, the idea I'm hoping to achieve with you all is that you can see somehow what you're learning here today, what you're learning at BITS, and how it actually gets applied in the area that you most probably haven't thought about, or if you have thought about it, I think we need to tell Americans, but uh, uh, let me not uh, go there at this stage. But the idea is to hopefully infuse you and show you how a very small area can cover literally all engineering disciplines in, and also others such as applied mathematics, geosciences, uh, geographical mapping, uh, the whole gamut. So that is the idea. Now, one of the things I've also learned in life is that pictures are always nice. And as a result, I'm going to show you a couple of pictures, uh, videos firstly, and this is important in terms of just to get your enthusiasm. And now, of course, I can't find the one that I first wanted to show you. There we go. And I'll come where we fit in. So, just look at here. Can you see that flashing? Can you see the shock waves reverberating? And this is the challenge we are facing. We've got a mandate in Africa where we've got to protect people, we've got to look after people. And the only way we can do that is if we can safely get in there and do that and supply the protection and supply the food and things like that. And this is what we face. And um, we need to be able to protect against it. So one of the first things that we'd like to do uh, is we need to know how material responds. Now this I like. This is a Hopkinson bar, a split Hopkinson bar. Uh, this is about 25 milliseconds that I've slowed down for you here. That is a copper coin we've made and we're getting the high strain rate pr uh, uh, parameters of this. Do you notice the bars are jiggling a little bit? That is the stress wave running up and down that bar. Have you learned about stress waves? I hope so. If not, um, I'll speak to the lecturers. And um, uh, it will do, uh, do. And then the, we need to understand sometimes, and this is a blast cubicle, so we put 8 kilograms of TNT under here. If you look very careful, that, that cubicle is moving upwards. And so we're able to understand, we can measure the forces, the acceleration, the stress waves that are running in this complex system. Um, we can quantify it. And then while we're busy, we need to know how it affects the human. So. This is inside that box, and these are two anthropomorphic test devices, crash test dummies, um, and we are measuring. There's a lot of things we're measuring here. We're measuring the floor displacement. We're measuring the loads that are transmitted. We're measuring the structural. This is about 600 g's acceleration vertically. Uh, uh, you know, to me, it's really uh, something that's really exciting. And then uh, other things that we look at. Um, and I'm, these are the teasers I'm putting in. Hopefully you'll listen in my uh, presentation. Other things that we face. This is a particularly nasty threat. You're going to see there's a flash. And there is what they call an explosively formed projectile. That thing there is moving at 2 kilometers a second. Think about that. Count to about 25 and you're in euphoria. That is an armored vehicle. That is a lot of energy. That is a lot of that one needs to neutralize. But if you are clever a little bit, and or not clever, let's say if you sit and you play around, you can actually develop something that will stop it. And if you look carefully here, you'll see there's a gray box. And this is what we what I'm going to share with you. This is how we apply material sciences, biomechanics, uh, material science, uh, major material sciences, mechanical engineering, uh, electronic engineering, uh, even industrial engineering. Uh, there's a there's application in what we're doing in our research. Um, this video is long. I need to be careful because I only have 20 minutes. But I thought it's important because it shows a lot of what we do. And again, I'm going to talk around it. And then uh, when I go to my presentation, I am going to skip some things. These are measurements. This test rig is the only one I'm aware of in the world that can measure the force time from a buried blast. This is South African technology. It enables us to do enormous. Uh, 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 advances or instance using this machine, we can predict the force or the impulse of a 10 kilogram TNT charge using 20 grams of PE4. Think about that. Think of the scale. That scale. This is uh, the tonics. Yeah, we come to chemistry. This is chemistry, understanding how a, a, a blast works, how it evolves. Can you see it's not an instantaneous thing? takes time. And in knowing this, you can. That's typically a threat. That's a car bomb. 
How do we stop this? This is research. Unfortunately, you're getting duplicates on these. Uh, if you look carefully at this video, in the bottom corner, you see that fire extinguisher move. So you survived the blast. Who wants a fire extinguisher hitting your head at 3 meters a second? I'm telling you, I don't. I certainly don't want that. And so, this is trauma biomechanics, medicine. They feet, the feet are damaged. You want the soldier to be able to come back into society. How do we reduce that injury that he can walk? Or she can walk? So, uh, crash test dummies. Uh, they instrumented for blasts. Uh, just showing the various things, spot about it. This looks so agricultural. That is simulating a landmine blast. Who thought that you could mechanically simulate the loading from a landmine blast? There you go. Modeling and simulation. Uh, I've got a, a slide on that. Very, very important as well. It's a tool. So people who like to program, like pretty pictures, very important. Again, showing the different ones. This is very important because the lower leg is important in a landmine blast. That's why we're showing it there. Here's our... Uh, uh, high speed video. There's so much we can do here. You can get the compliance of the rubber element in that surrogate leg. Uh, showing you what we're able to do in, uh, in analyzing. And this contributes not just to South Africa, but to the world. In terms of making our soldiers and least keep it safe. This one's a bit long, but it looks cool. That's a four leg if anyone's interested in crash test on it. Um, it doesn't work well in landmine blasts as we found out. Uh, this was work we did with the Canadian uh, Research Institute. Uh, we also test vehicles. Uh, we verify and we support the local industry so when they sell vehicles we can say that this vehicle can withstand a certain amount of explosive and the people will survive. Um, in doing this uh, we are recognized internationally uh, and so as a result we can do this. I'll touch on that. That's a flash x-ray. This is just another one of the box I think. I'm going to stop now. Um, no, there might be some other nice ones coming up as well. Uh, just showing how we stop. You saw the box mounted on the vehicle and how we stop it. This is just some of the research we do in trying to see how the target responds and what we can pick up in terms of how effective our solutions are. You saw all those little flashes. That's what it creates. This is, if I'm right, about 50 millimeters of rolled homogenous armor. And that's that EFP. Straight through it. This is what we've got to protect against. It's scary. Um, landmine boots. In, in, uh, luckily, there is a ban on landmines, especially anti personal mines. But in some areas, they still use them. Cluster munitions. Uh, trying to develop a practical solution. It's not very practical, but there is always uh, compromise in life. And we did a lot of work in doing this, developing surrogate legs, understanding the stress wave transmission through the leg. This is important to understand how the leg gets damaged so that one can also then modify your protection because you can't protect everything. And what we call it is modify the prognosis, how the person will recover and that they can recover to be a fully functioning uh, member of society. I know I'm repeating that. They're just cool pictures. Um, we don't see this often. That's about 100 grams of explosive. It's, uh, and look what it does. It's, uh, it's really, really quite uh, scary. And then the 50 kilogram, uh, that's again, if you like shock waves, think about that. Um, you see that wave, that wave going through. If you put aluminium in here, that shock wave that's reverberating energizes that aluminium. And you get a longer pressure pulse. It's amazing what we discovered to kill them. All right, I think that I think it's enough blast. The other thing that I want to mention as well that I didn't touch on, we also do mobility. Now, the reason that mobility is involved in this is that mobility and protection are interlinked. If you got, if you drive so fast that they can't shoot you, you're protected. You don't need inches of armor, so that's great. To stop a bullet, you need. 180 kilograms, 190 kilograms per square meter aerial density. Now you put that around your vehicle, your vehicle weighs 20 tons, you're going nowhere. So mobility and protection are very, very interlinked. And what I wanted to show you uh, is also what we do. So coming on to the slower world of things. Um, this is world meeting software. This is digital, uh, uh, um, uh, digital element modeling. And 
Why this is important is uh, we also do autonomous vehicles. Now, autonomous vehicles are easy peasy in Sweden. Their trucks are running. They're running on roads that have parkings. They're running with GPS. They're running with radio transmitters in the roadsides. They're not in a GPS environment off road. They're not on top. And um, this last video I wanted to show you. Uh, this is uh, with a company we're collaborating with in America. Um, one of the key elements with computational modeling is that you can explore. And it's types of technologies like these that you can start to think and really, in my mind, you know, go beyond what we know. Uh, I think it is really, really interesting. Uh, you will see where I come back in on computational modeling. All right, it's just, this is cool. All right, so let me get on to the presentation. So, uh, where am I? There we go. All right. Okay, so we've introduced myself. Uh, I'm going to run through the first slides a little bit quickly, but please look carefully because there's some important elements I'd like to raise. This is what I'm going to cover. I've shown you all the videos. There's one last video, but you've seen it last, uh, just to always round it off. And this is what I'm going to cover. As you can see, I've tried to, these are the areas we're focusing in, and I'm going to show you literally mechanical, electronic, uh, industrial engineers, metallurgists, uh, who else? Uh, our, uh, our, our, what, the wacky lot, the applied mathematicians, they all have a role to play in this and add value and enable us to do this. Important CSR, we're quite old, more than 75 years old. Who knows why the CSR was founded? I'm going to be a little bit obscure. Who's been to Cape Point? What is on the very tippy, tippy, tippy end of Cape Point? It's an old radar station. When Britain was under threat from the Nazis in World War II, they gave radar technology to three countries, South Africa, Canada, and the US. And that little radar station was built in the Second World War. And the CSR was founded in 1945 primarily to research radar. So, Ta-da! Useless fact that will never help you. Um, doesn't this count? What is that, what's that additional stuff they have to study? <laughs> Complementary studies. There we go. So, history. Um, I'm putting this up. The CSR is a national asset. We are not a business. All right? Unfortunately, it doesn't matter. You still have to make a little bit of money, otherwise you're not going to exist. But this is what makes me excited about what we do. We are yet to grow South Africa. And um, it's a passion that I have uh, with regards to it. So I'm not going to go through You can find this on the internet. Um, these are our core values. And the very important one, that the basis of today is the collaboration. You've got to collaborate. We don't have sufficient money to research everything. We need to collaborate. And from universities through, and you'll see that at the end on this. Strategic objective is always important. You've got to do this, otherwise you don't get money from the guys who have money. Um, this is the current structure of the CSR, the most important one, as you can see, it's large. Uh, I'm only going to be talking about that, and only one element in there, the defense and security cluster. But don't think, when you think CSR, don't just think here. There's biosciences, advanced manufacturing, there's a lot of other areas, advanced materials, um, and a lot of other opportunities, really exciting opportunities in the CSR. Um, this is just blurb, 2,140 people, it's not too bad. And um, I've got to show you, we fall under the Department of Science and Innovation. Very important if you think about that, we're a national asset. And because of the defense cluster, we have a very strong role with the Department of Defense and Arms Corps. Uh, I told you I was going to run through this. Again, nice blurb. This is, and literally everything I'm going to discuss, you'll see actually is related to this. And here are all the units in defense and security. You can see we still got radar. Uh, so we're still going strong with radar on that. And then the nanosciences with our dummy. Um, I'll let you read this and it shows you the range. Hopefully you see some of these. We also modify or when required design rapid prototyping. We're not industry. This is what makes our world exciting. Who knows about the skunk works? We're the aero guys. Nobody knows about skunk works. Jeepers. Skunk works is where you really develop things that are new and exciting and you keep it secret, you keep it behind a big curtain. And that's sort of what we do. Um, and it's really, really nice. We push bounds. We overload vehicles. We have to. 
But what does that do? And we need to understand that. And we need to do it cleverly so we don't kill people in the process. Um, so there's a range of things that we do. So now onto the areas that we study, detonics. The main key you need to take here, detonics, is in a different time frame. It's in another world. We're talking here hundreds, sometimes tens, but hundreds of nanoseconds through to, in the extreme cases, seconds. But literally, most detonations are over within a hundred and about one millisecond. The smaller ones are over in less, 50 microseconds. And that's what I'm trying to show you here. What does this mean? It means we need test and measurement equipment that can go really fast. We've got equipment that can survive very aggressive environments. We've got to be able to make sense of the data that we get out of these environments. The way that it loads the body is completely different to what you get in a car crash. And that sort of leads into the next one. Um, unfortunately, if only we stay in this area, I'd be very, very happy. But I need to go all the way here because when the vehicle comes down, it can be up to many seconds later. So it makes it difficult. Um, if you're running a camera at 20,000 frames per second and megapixel, I haven't even figured out yet how many hundreds of gigabytes of data you will have to capture five seconds. This is another picture I really, really like. Um, do, you, do you understand two million frames per second? It means I take a photograph every, jeepers, I'm trying, I think it's about every 500 or 50 nanoseconds of taking a photograph, I'm taking a photograph, I'm taking a photograph. And this is a sequence, a sequence of photographs. This is a detonator. You've seen an explosion. To get an explosion, you put the detonator in, the detonator explodes, it sets off the booster, that sets off the main charge. This is the initiation. And we stop in time here. So this to me is really, really cool. And uh, I love spurious information. These pictures were taken on a camera that was based on technology that was developed for the Manhattan Project. Who knows what the Manhattan Project was? Okay, that's a bit better. That was the development of the nuclear bomb. They weren't able to get the bomb to initiate because you need symmetric detonation. And they couldn't solve the problem, so they developed a camera called the rotating mirror camera. And that camera was used and it found out that the detonating wire to the one detonator was longer by two feet. I must convert myself, so about 1.6 meters. Uh, no, no, less than a meter. What's it? About 500 millimeters, 600 millimeters. Longer than the other, and that was sufficient delay that you couldn't get uh, nuclear uh, 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 fission to take place. So... Nearly what? Nearly almost 80 year old technology in this. The next area, material sciences. This is really, really important. Again, uh, I didn't touch on that there, but uh, in detonics you've got mechanical engineers, chemists, applied mathematicians. Uh, so, sorry about that, but uh, in this case as well, uh, material sciences, engineering, uh, metallurgists, uh, mechanical engineers, uh, chemical engineers. Uh, again, applied mathematics and then metallurgy is also very important here. The key issue we need to deal with is that we're dealing with high strain rate. There are strain rates that are higher. High speed steel mills, and they're reducing the bullets down, are, are very, very high. They tend to the six. This is off the scale here. Uh, space impacts are very high strain rate. But you can see we're dealing with strain rates here in the region of 10 to the 10 to the 4. And why is that important? If you look here, you can see different strain rates. Can you see how the material changes? The same material, but different strain rates. It's important to understand that can be a benefit. Who's seen the video with the jelly, when they shoot the jelly and the shotgun doesn't go through? Oh, well done. <laughs> I thought you guys all watched YouTube videos. But that's strain rate hardening and how it can stop. Understanding that can make an enormous difference in saving lives or introducing new technology. So that's our Hopkinson bar, the cameras, and just showed you how we fit in. And this is important when I get to the computational modeling part. The blue line uh, is, um, is experimental in, uh, in this case. Yeah, it's really experimental, I think. And how we fit the data to get a model. But these are uh, parameters that we're extracting. And I'll, I'll, does anyone understand that uh, picture up in the top corner? Top right hand corner. Okay, but you don't need a bursary ram. I was going to say, whoever understands that picture, come see me for a bursary. But <laughs> It's actually, it's the way old scientists confused us, younger scientists. Uh, but that's actually how a Hopkinson bar works. Remember, did you see it when it hit that sample out, it's reverberating. And that's basically giving the reflections of the waves through the bar. 
Am I boring you, or is it still nobody's asleep yet? All right. Then we come to trauma biomechanics. And are, are there any biomechanic engineers here? Biomedical, sorry. Okay. At least five. I've got, I've got five minutes left. Okay, I've got to be quick. Very important. This is where we can use you. Trauma biomechanics and injury biomechanics. Very important. Here's the loading rates. Um, this just shows you because we go from the dummy, we go through testing, and we go into modeling and simulation. Um, military mobility, uh, again, interior mechanics show you the different types of engineering we can use. This is a real trace of an autonomous vehicle doing the same test. You see, we have a problem. We need to go get coffee. Oh, look nice over there. Are you going to put a weapon on this? Are you going to allow this to take a soldier? You see the research we need to do. Uh, uh, this to me is a very, very interesting uh, problem. Computational modeling. That picture in the top right hand corner is a rendering from a real video from a real test uh, train. And that's got real physical data behind that. Who likes games here? This is serious gaming now. That's important. Computational modeling. I had to do this slide. Uh, you can ignore everything else except uh, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Sabata, are you here? Yeah. Okay, this is the slide for you. All right, computational modeling underpins everything we do. It's important. It's really, really important. And this is just showing you how we combine everything. Uh, I don't have time, otherwise I explain this. It's actually showing you how we go through using scaling. Scaling is very important. Hopkinson scaling. You must look at that. And don't forget there were three Hopkinsons, not just one. As the bad guy, the sun took over, the one sun died, and then the other sun took over. And again, showing rendering and modeling and simulation. Uh, these are nice pictures, but broad range of application. Um, I, did, I forgot to show this video. This is a computational model using the best possible material models. Here's this. Here's what we predicted. This is what we got. Whoops. Whoops. Work to be done. The exciting part is we did this with digital image correlation using real blast. We're able to capture it so we can really do strong verification and validation of computational models. Test and measurement. Uh, we've got a range of laboratories. The important is we have about 650 hectares north of Pretoria where we do a lot of blast testing. Uh, prototyping workshop. We need industrial engineers. We need an effective, adaptable workshop that we can do this with. Test and measurement. We've touched, you can see there's a lot of things, and then software. Uh, that we have to be able to uh, run all of this. Collaboration. I had to get to this one quickly. So this is the core of what we do, collaboration. And what's exciting is we work with local universities. So we have bursaries. We co-supervise. Um, we give vacation work projects, design work projects. We actually have some in the moment on the go uh, at BITS. Um, we also do ex uh, moderation, external, and collaborative research. Um, we also collaborate with the Defence Force, very important. We get their uh, technicians, they come work with us. And we train them and we help them become registered with EXA. Uh, we work with the local defence research, which is primarily arms core companies down in Cape Town, Simons Town, uh, up here, to remember all those places. The local defence industries, we work with them, helping them with their products, doing certain niche work for them, including the cash and transit industry. And this to me is what's really exciting is that we have strong collaboration internationally. We are on a number of international research panels, and why is that important? We've got access to these very leading scientists, but with us we've got work, and with the work, with the students, they get the opportunity to present their work. So we learn. We're learning from people who have hundreds of millions of dollars worth of research funding. And this is one of the benefits of collaboration. And I'm really uh, Imperial College London, Karolinska Institute in Sweden. Uh, in Germany, in France, uh, in Poland, uh, even in America. Uh, and, uh, it is, it's, it's to me one of the most exciting things out. All right, and ta-da, I told you there's one more video. But that's it. So at this stage, um, please just check out the CSR's website uh, for opportunities and things like that. If you're interested in anything, you know Mr. Jones, chat to him about it if you want a vacation work project or you would like a design project. Trust me, it will be exciting and you will have fun. Uh, okay, I won't call the guy out, but speak to the odds that have been with us. Ask them if they had fun with us. Ask them if they learned. Ask them, was it exciting? All right.